Hey friends, got a fantastic episode for you. Coming up, documentary director and Vanity Fair writer Matt Ternauer is about to come your way. But before we get there, I know what you're thinking. How can I support this show that I enjoy for free each and every week? Well, the answer is simple. Head to comingupnext.com.au where you can find links to subscribe to the show, where you can also rate and review the show, and you'll find the entire back catalogue of podcast rambles at comingupnext.com.au. Should we get on with it? Hey folks, what's up? How's it going? How's things in your world? Welcome to episode 166 of Coming Up Next, the podcast. I'm Alastair Marks. If this is your first time listening, this is my show. On the show, I have a uh, philosophical ramble, well, sometimes philosophical, but always rambly, uh, with, uh, with creatives about how they've created and how they are sustaining a life in creative industries. Uh, thank you to my guest from last week. He is uh, the journeyman actor, as he kind of self-professed to me on the show, Simon Maiden. Um, if you haven't seen Upgrade which is the latest flick he's involved with. You can check it out on the various on-demand platforms. It's a, uh, it's a rollicking action film from uh, Lee Winnell. Well, action uh, genre. Uh, you make up your mind, and then you can tweet me with, uh, with what genre you think the film is. Matt Turnauer is my guest this week, and Matt has a particularly uh, fascinating story. Uh, he came up through the ranks of journalism, uh, working for Vanity Fair, and then moved into moved into documentary filmmaking. It's a little bit of a uh, a rolling theme um, uh, in the the documentary guests or documentarian guests that I've been having on the show of late. Uh, I'm sure it has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that I've been uh, working my way through the world of documentary filmmaking. But that aside, uh, Matt. His latest films uh, include Scotty and the Secret History of Hollywood and the documentary on Studio 54. I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to meet Matt and to see Scotty and the Secret History of Hollywood uh, whilst I was in Los Angeles a couple of months ago and I uh, definitely felt like I needed to speak with him on the show about putting it together. It was put together over a number of years and uh, delves into a side of Hollywood that's not really been explored, uh, at least to my knowledge, in uh, in film before. So anyway, we talk about that. We talk about uh, his first film, Valentino and the Last Emperor. Uh, we talk about the process. We talk about the philosophical stuff. So let's get into it right now. Coming up next, 166 with Matt Turnauer. <laughs> So you grew up in uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, yes, I'm an L.A. native. I grew up in a part of the city uh, near the ocean, near Santa Monica. And I was uh, from what then would have been called a, a TV family. At that time, Hollywood was very split between movies, which was called the industry, and television, which was referred to as the business. And uh, my father was a TV writer-producer. He did shows like Columbo, very famous still. And uh, there was definitely this distinction. Movies were upper echelon, and uh, in TV, you were just making a living, basically. Mm. Do you remember the first time, I mean, obviously growing up in, in, a, in a TV family, uh, you would have been surrounded, I imagine, by um, your dad being a writer and producer by show business uh, in the TV world anyway. Do you remember the first thing that you made or that you created or that you were kind of, that you, that you were inspired to write? That's a great question that no one has ever asked me. I was always writing things actually. And uh, probably kind of like fake newspapers, I think, <laughs> yeah. which, which makes sense because... I was uh, a journalist professionally leading into my filmmaking career. Yeah, right. So I remember vaguely making kind of like 
newspapers and things like that. And then in early in grade school, I started it. I remember with a friend who I still am in touch with, we started a newspaper in, uh, in our third grade class. So that was uh, one of the first creative things that I was in charge of, probably. You're going around uh, getting I, like uh, getting getting fake scoops and and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was your typical elementary school class with about forty kids in it, but we put out a weekly newspaper. I remember very little about it other than we. I worked very hard on it. I remember that. I took it very seriously and got yeah. very upset when. Uh, when other people did not uh, do their job properly, I re- that's about all I remember. <laughs> so, were you brought up on uh, on any particular types of film or, uh, or or television? Was was documentary in the world of journalism quite um, prevalent in your home? Well, growing up, all media was prevalent in the house I lived in. Uh, the TV was on in the background a lot. The news was always on in the evening i was always very interested in it and uh you know there were two newspapers every morning the new york times and the la times uh you know at a certain point in people in los angeles uh who were educated families you know like uh you know upper income families i suppose uh got the new york times not the la times principally and uh, usually both but that was an interesting distinction starting in the probably the late 1980s that people, even though you're 3,000 miles away from New York, you read the New York Times. And every magazine, every important magazine, and I was very interested in all of them and read all of them. I was probably the first one to kind of steal the magazines when they arrived out of the mail. <laughs> uh, and movies were important too. I, we went to the movies all the time. And, uh, Documentary less so. I think documentary as a, a form wasn't really available. Uh, there was cable TV was not interested in documentaries then. And documentaries didn't really play in movie theaters in Los Angeles at that time. There were very few art houses in the city. So... Uh, the ones that were there, I eventually started to go to when I got into film as a as a teenager, but they weren't really showing a lot of documentaries. It's funny, documentary as a uh, as a kind of consumable art form, I suppose, has really only in the last maybe five or ten years become like quite prevalent. Yes, that's true. I think there was a cultural uh, shift in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, where Hollywood had a resurgence, uh, you know, brought on by Jaws and Star Wars, and the the blockbuster film was born. And movie theaters uh, geared themselves toward that, and you can understand why, because they made lots of money. The revival film houses, of which LA, I don't think, ever had that many, really, compared to New York. New York had and still has a few. L.A. had, uh, I remember, a couple, and I went to them a lot when I was in high school because I became obsessed with film and all of my friends had that mutual interest. There was the New Beverly Theater, which was the principal revival house. There were a couple others, but that's where everyone really went. And it, at the time, was an independent theater that had a, a program, so you would get the calendar, it was called it's called a calendar house and uh the new art is still a calendar house that's as well here as well and they probably showed docs but we didn't pay much attention to them actually we were seeing kind of like the classic hollywood and foreign films there yeah right and um, having a having a father who worked in in the biz even though he was working in uh, in tv land was that uh was that beneficial to your obsession or was it kind of like something that you didn't really see as aligning oh no it was very uh beneficial because every day he went to the movie studio to work so uh this was i mean it's it's la and it's hollywood so a lot of other people's parents did that as well but 
even in a so-called company town where a lot of people worked at studios, there was still a kind of excitement and glamour to that idea. Uh, so he was very interested in, in movies and Hollywood history and had a library of, uh, Hollywood history books. And in fact, I, you're just reminding me, we had a screening room in our house. It was a projection room with uh, 16 and eight millimeter. And, uh, there was a library of, of old film there. Like on celluloid. On, yeah, on, uh, real film that we used to run on projectors. Uh, so yeah, it was everywhere. It was permeated. And, you know, next door, our next door neighbor was a director named Fred Zinneman who directed, uh, uh, from here to eternity yeah and a lot of other classic movies and what was he like uh well you know because it's la you don't know your neighbors <laughs> right <laughs> the, the not a small houses town. we never met him the houses were very far apart right it was up in the hills gotcha so you studied at the uh, crossroads school for arts and science yes i went to a school called crossroads which was uh, at the time frequently mistaken for a reform school because of the name, it sounded like a drug rehabilitation place or something, but it really was a uh, elite, uh, liberal, kind of hippie prep school in uh, Santa Monica that had a large student body. Well, actually, the student body was small, but there was a large contingent of uh, Hollywood people who sent their kids there. And what was your, I suppose... If you're going to a school like that, it's probably going to be quite supportive of people who have creative endeavors, um, being that it's a school for arts and science. Well, yeah, everyone was kind of into arts and, in fact, to the point where most of the people I know from high school uh, are still in the arts. And I don't think I know any lawyers or doctors or professional people because the school just didn't attract that type of left brain achiever it was a really arty school and a lot of people went into into show business from there Mm. Uh, and at what point did you kind of make the decision that you were gonna go into journalism um i kind of had it in mind and then what happened was i graduated from college and I had worked as an intern as a magazine in New York called spy, which was a humor magazine that changed magazines forever. It was a really inspired publication, very sophisticated, witty humor magazine based on a couple British magazines, punch and private eye were, are two things in England that Spy was based on. And uh, I was very interested in that working in that and working there. And I got a job as an intern and then went back and graduated from school and wanted to uh, go back working there. But what happened is that the, uh, the two editors kind of uh, split at that point. And Graydon Carter went on to become the editor of the New York Observer, a small newspaper on the Upper East Side of New York, and uh, kind of like a daily edition of The New Yorker. He hired me right out of college to write articles for him there, which I did. And then within nine months, he was hired to be editor of Vanity Fair, and he brought me with him. So right out of college, I landed this plum job by being in the right place at the right time, more or less. And then I had a journalism career almost, it was almost instant because I was writing for a top magazine at at that tender age. That's pretty incredible, pretty remarkable. Did you feel like, was there a kind of weight that came with that or did you just kind of take it in your stride? Oh, it was very exciting uh, because Condé Nast at that time was uh, at the height of its powers was a very rich company that took care of its staff extremely well 
So there was a real glamour to it that has ceased to exist. The headquarters of Condé Nast, which published Vanity Fair and Vogue and many other magazines, was on Madison Avenue at um, 44th Street. And uh, it was very glamorous cinematic setting with, um, I don't know, very formal offices and there were town cars that waited for staff idling at the curb. They would just sit there for hours waiting for people to get in them and drive them anywhere they wanted. And uh, this seems unbelievable today. Yeah. The print media is in such uh, shape, dire shape. And, uh, you know, the power, of course, is in tech and digital and Silicon Valley and all the digital places don't don't treat their staff like that anymore. And there's a great informality to it. So I saw sort of the last days of uh, last decade and a half, probably, of that golden age of the magazine. Yeah, it must have been a pretty remarkable moment to be around. Was there a kind of was there an awareness that this was like on the way out or did it just kind of happen? No, at that time, there was no sense that this would come to an end. Uh, and there were early warning signs. There had been what people call print recessions, where advertisers pulled back and magazines reacted and kind of cut staff a little bit. But then things bounced back. The expense accounts were extraordinary. And the atmosphere was very high, heightened. It was very abfab. Abfab could be about Condé Nast. People really behaved that way. <laughs> and uh, that was sort of a funny parallel universe. But if you want to know what it was like, it was it was very much abfab. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you started seeing the writing on the wall, is that when you decided that you wanted to get into making documentary films or was it something that you'd always sort of had in the back of your mind as that was the next logical step for you? Yeah, I had been thinking about filmmaking for years and I was even a filmmaker in college or sorry, a film major in college. And I, all my friends were heading out to LA to write spec screenplays I didn't have a lot of interest in doing that, mainly because I got this great job. So I immediately got a really extraordinary once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to work at Vanity Fair. And there was no way for me to get into film, really, because it was more than a full-time job. And, you know, I was writing cover stories, and uh, it was all-consuming and very fulfilling and... uh, great adventure to go on so eventually after having worked at that for more than 10 years i began thinking about making documentary film because it seemed like a logical progression from the type of long-form magazine journalism that i was experienced at telling the story um in a in a longer format and having uh you know deep character study i could do that in print so i wanted to flex those filmmaking muscles that kind of visual angle on it and i began to contemplate that and look for subjects and try to figure out how to do that uh, which i eventually did and was it through your the the connections or the work that you'd done with vanity fair that you were able to get in touch with valentino to start the process of making the doc with him very much so. I mean, Vanity Fair, especially at that time, if you had a prominent job there, you could call almost anyone and they return your call. So you could propose a story on almost anyone. And if the story was approved, they would almost certainly participate just because of the prestige of the title. I actually was assigned to write about Valentino. That's how I met Valentino and his partner, Giancarlo Giametti. I was given this uh, feature profile story, which sent me to Rome. And I spent weeks on and off reporting this story around the world because they move around a lot. So I would follow them. And then the 
story came out. But before I had finished reporting the story, I asked them if they would be interested in doing a documentary because I saw it as I was spending time with them. I saw the movie and I could visualize what it was and envision what a 90 minute feature film on them would be. Uh, the story I wrote has clues to that, but I really saw it as uh, an immersive uh, cinema verite documentary that could be much more powerful than a print piece on them because their interaction uh, was so colorful and their world was so vivid. So they said yes, and I went for it. Do you think they said yes to you specifically because you had already developed a rapport with them and there was already some trust there and you obviously had the credibility of Vanity Fair behind you so you were able to really immerse yourself in their world as a kind of fly on the wall without them feeling like uh, worried where, you know, where it might go or where it might end up? Yeah, I think they trusted me and they obviously knew me. I think another advantage was that the story came out well and that I was an American. I think that having an American made film on them made them feel more secure. And I, I wisely so in a certain sense, the American market's the largest film market in the world. So things created here tend to get a bigger audience and more of an international audience. So I think they realized that. And I think also my non-fashion background appealed to them. I really didn't know anything about fashion. The only thing I knew was Valentino and that world. And I had no, what you might call, lurid interest in every detail of their fashion career because... The fashion world is so small and obsessive. I find that the designers don't really want to talk about it in particular. They'd rather talk about other things and uh, a broader range of topics so that I wasn't a person that was uh, minutely focused on things fashion, I think was a relief to them. So you were obviously presenting a, a film that was about a relationship or about certain person as opposed to and the the kind of prism of it is the world of fashion but it's not what uh it's not the main focus that's what i was doing i it's not really to say that they understood what i was doing i i'm not quite sure they knew what i was doing and i didn't really want them to know but i was making a pretty standard biographical film about their, their career which in, I was, in, in a sense, but I was really principally making a movie about the relationship, which they didn't see as being forward or significant. They, they never saw their relationship as the primary interest in them. They see their career and the, the clothes and the money and the, uh, a bit of the lifestyle as the forward story, but uh, that was, for me, all secondary what was really important to me was the relationship that brought the career and made the career possible because it's a partnership. It's, it's really a marriage and two very successful gay guys in Rome who've been all but married because you can't get legally married in Italy, of course, but they are married basically metaphorically uh, was a really interesting story to me. And how did you begin to build the story? Because you've, you've shot it over two years. And, I mean, there's so much, obviously, archival footage of, of, of these guys um, from being in the public spotlight. How did you start to construct the story with, uh, with, with you know, over 250 hours of, of vision? Um, was it something that you were doing as you were going? Did you have an outline in mind or was it something that, really evolved once you already had everything in the can a little bit of both i had an idea of what i wanted the piece to be the movie to be but with the uh, verite shooting you don't really know what you're going to get and a lot of what you get 
is great and a lot of what you think is great is just terrible. So until you really get the dailies sorted and the project organized and the editor engaged and you start into post-production, the true shape of it is not apparent. Then you have to figure out what stays and what goes and what is emphasized and what's de-emphasized. So thematically, I knew what I wanted to emphasize, and I was going for that. So I would, the important things for me to shoot were things where Giametti and Valentino were together and interacting and had getting them doing that in as natural way as possible. So I focused in production on that primarily, and then everything else I, you know, spent less time on. But things, certain things were very important, like the process of making the, the collections and also the fashion shows that I made sure I shot thoroughly. Yeah, there were no, or there were a few other interviews, rather. There were a few supporting interviews in there with other people. Then we had this uh, 200, 250 hours, and then archival, and with the editor, Bob Eisenhart, who's the great Verite editor we started to piece it together. And how did you feel like your process from that, from working on Valentino and, and through this, this kind of, um, I guess, almost trial and error, uh, ha had evolved into Citizen Jane and then into Scotty and the secret history of Hollywood? I think that all of my films are deep dives and they all so far um, examine particular worlds that are frequently closed worlds that have closed systems in them and I immerse myself into these worlds and spend a lot of time trying to make things that are definitive uh, portrayals of whatever that world is so Valentino is that the next film I made was called uh, Citizen Jane which is a actually an all archival film about Jane Jacobs, the public intellectual and activist who wrote an immortal book called the death and life of great American cities, which was published in 1961. Uh, and it's, uh, the, the subtitle of the book in England is called, uh, I think it's called an attack on town planning. And, she did that. She really changed the way everyone sees and thinks about the city, especially New York City, where she was based and uh, her activism principally took place until she moved to Toronto later in life. She had a nemesis, Robert Moses, who was known as the uh, power broker, the most powerful unelected official in American history. And uh, the film tells the story of the destruction of the city. Uh, and I don't just mean New York, I mean all cities, by urban renewal and highways and everything that we consider the, the modern condition today. And uh, it was a sweeping, it's a sweeping political film about power and activism. It must have been but very uh, fascinating to dig into. Yeah, it's a, it was it's, it was a particular world that is uh, um, you know distinct, and uh, it was funded by the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations and a few other very generous foundations and people, and uh, it was a film I wanted to make about politics and power, and the power of uh, of activism. And then the film after that is one that's currently in movie theaters called Scotty and the Secret History of Hollywood, which is an alternate history of Hollywood through the lens, through the eyes of, in a sense, uh, one person, Scotty Bowers, who is now 95 and was a Marine in the Second World War, discharged into the kind of Hollywood mix who didn't go back to the farm he was from in uh, rural Illinois 
like many young men of that time, relocated to the big city. And he had a career trajectory unlike anyone else's. He got work in a gas station on Hollywood Boulevard, and he had been working as a male prostitute. He turned the gas station into a brothel. And it was still a functioning gas station, but he recruited other Marine veterans and uh, uh, people from all branches of the military, actually, and some women. And he uh, ran this operation there for years. And it was a mythic place that uh, everyone in Hollywood who was interested in such things knew about. But it was a closed world, again, that uh, really was secret, hence the title Scotty in the Secret History of Hollywood. So this film explores the uh, narratives of Hollywood that get no attention because they were necessarily secrets, because they were flouted the law and they flouted convention. This, uh, studios had morals clauses at the time and Hollywood actors and anyone important in town had to keep their sexuality a secret. It turns out that Bowers was the great secret keeper of this community, who also was the great fixer-upper. So he not only kept your secret, but he uh, he created the secrets as well. Yeah, it's uh, it's a remarkable story. I um, was very fortunate to come to a screening uh, when I was in Los Angeles recently, and it's a story that I'd certainly never heard about, and subsequently speaking to other people about it it's uh it's very little known um how did you i know that scotty uh released a memoir um a few years back was that how you discovered the story or was there a, was there an, a different way i had heard about him for years but never by name i used to do stories about older characters in hollywood who were legends and having comebacks or trying to come back and uh, people that really had huge careers but hadn't had a lot of attention on them. And one of them was a talk show host named Merv Griffin, who's an extremely famous person in the United States, a household name who's not known anywhere else. He told me about this gas station. He said that uh, there was a gas station on Hollywood Boulevard and uh, you would go there to get into trouble. Uh, he didn't give me any other information, but I took note of that. <laughs> And then over over the years, other older citizens of the town, mostly gay, told me there was a gas station and it was a brothel and cars were lined up around the block to get in there. I always said, well, this would be a great Vanity Fair story if I could ever find out anything about it. And eventually, I was with the writer Gore Vidal, and he had a house in the Hollywood Hills, he was a friend of mine. One day, apropos nothing, he just blurted out, I, I'd like to see Scotty again. I said, who's Scotty? He said, Scotty was my pimp, and he had a gas station. I said, wait, this is the same person with the Richfield station on Hollywood Boulevard. He said, yeah, that's right. I, so I realized Scotty was still around, and eventually Vidal and he connected, reconnected, and that's how I met him. And uh, the day I met him, I asked him to do the movie, and he agreed because we had this mutual friendship with Gore Vidal, whom he had met in 1948 at this uh, Richfield station on Hollywood Boulevard and Van Ness. That's a pretty remarkable connection to, uh, to, to make. And, um, you know, so much of the film is, is looking at morality through the eyes of, uh, of a particular time and what was right and what was wrong and, and how people had to kind of hide their identities um, because of, like you say, because of the law or because of contract. What was it that you were particularly interested in digging into uh, as a kind of starting point? And I guess how did the process differ to something like Valentino? The process was relatively similar to Valentino because it was sort of a verite film. Uh, so I was basically with my relatively small film crew blending in to the environment of Scotty. Of course, Scotty isn't, you know, a famous fashion designer who lives like uh, Louis XIV. Uh, <laughs> he's 
not a poor man, but he he lives very simply, and he he has other attributes. Um, he's a hoarder, and uh, he had a couple houses, still does, that are hoarding paradises. So we were shooting in his environments and really just debriefing him uh, over the course of a two-year shoot. And uh, all these people, places, and things that were clues to a lost world of uh, a lost secret world of Hollywood that no one really wanted to talk about publicly for years started to, to kind of reveal themselves as we sorted through his collections, which were mixed up in his hoarder's uh, rooms. So there would be, you know, 10,000 newspapers, but then you'd find uh, 25 photographs. And uh, those weren't easily gotten because he didn't really catalog anything. So uh, there are a lot of photos and memorabilia that it revealed themselves over this long shoot. There's a certain amount of patience you need making a verite film. You're not going to get everything on the first day or in the first week because people don't really reveal that much. They reveal what they think is important, but what they think is important frequently isn't important at all. So then larger truths start to come out as you spend more time with them. And for instance, in this film, again, much like Valentino, there's a marriage and this is between Scotty and his wife. I know you're thinking Scotty is a, a gay prostitute nominally, but he's married to a woman, uh, which just is the fact. And see the movie if you want to know how that all works. <laughs> but he, uh, you know, his wife was reluctant to be in the film at first, and we sort of worked our way in and then uh, she's she's the star of the film with him and people really respond to her character she's a square in his parlance she's a not a swinger he's a super swinger and she he's married to a square which is interesting and provides a certain kind of insight into who he is the, the dynamic on screen is uh is is really something uh Something that should be seen. Um, was there any uh, were there any kind of shocking revelations that happened as you were going? Oh well, there were dozens of them. I mean, you know, movie stars up to the most shocking uh, transgressive sex acts, uh, which Scotty was an eyewitness to. Um, every permutation of sexuality, and uh, you know, from. Uh, vanilla to the most outlandish there was a you know all these people are not with us anymore for the most part and a lot of this happened a long time ago so there's a certain uh, patina to it but uh one thing that stands out was about the almost forgotten movie star john Dahl, who was in a lot of film noir pictures and was in the movie rope he had really outlandish, according to Scotty, of sexual proclivities. He was a big S and M uh, person, so Scotty used to have to come up with really elaborate schemes. That nothing was too extreme. He would bring him up to into the canyons of L.A. during severe thunderstorms and tie him naked upside down from sturdy trees and leave him swinging there overnight in the storms and then go and cut and cut him down in the morning. And then he would want to be brought down to a drainage ditch and put in the drainage ditch and almost drowned by the runoff of the drainage. Uh, really extreme, crazy things like that. that That's a unique uh, kink. Yeah, exactly. So, he he has a uh, dozen scores of those stories. And was there anything that you were feeling like? Was there was there ever a point where you were feeling like this was being disparaging, or there was uh, was there any kind of question about the, the the truthfulness of what Scotty was saying? No, uh, he checks very well. So. Uh, Disparaging, I, I didn't feel that way. Scotty is not a disparaging person. Uh, he's very positive 
not judgmental at all. So his stories about everyone was uh, his stories about all these people were uh, told without judgment. And uh, I think that's very interesting in and of itself. In a way, he's a student of Dr. Kinsey, the great sexologist, who did more than almost anyone to normalize people's perspectives on uh, alternative sexualities, sexuality in general. Kinsey studied Scotty, and, and Scotty befriended Kinsey. So I think he comes at it from, even though he's not a physician or anything close to that, uh, he's a wise person who I think... Uh, has a revol- has a revolutionary take on sex and sexuality, and that it's uh, not something to be judged or uh, or controlled or prescribed. Uh, he is very accepting, so that I thought was interesting. And a lot of the movie is about that. In terms of uh, being able to um, kind of uh, fact check him, he's really uh, a great truth teller. I fact-checked everything I could, nothing in the movie that I didn't check out is in the movie. So, and I could check out almost everything. It, you can find information that corroborates almost everything he says. And uh, I'll give you an example. I, the, something that people find very unbelievable is that uh, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor were his clients. Uh, well, he says how he met them was, was through several people whom he knew clearly through his tricking among them Cecil Beaton the photographer and uh, artist production designer and ultimately diarist whose uh, diaries are published in multiple volumes and in one of them uh, I think it's a 70s diary there's a chapter called Scotty in which Beaton describes Scotty and says what he does and how he knows him and where they meet, which is at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Uh, one of the people who Scotty says introduced him to the Duke and Duchess was Cecil Beaton, who knew the Duke and Duchess very well. And the Duke and Duchess, Scotty says, were his clients at the Beverly Hills Hotel. I found a picture of them at the Beverly Hills Hotel in the 50s. Most, a lot of people had said to me, well, you know, this is a lie because Duke and Duchess never came to Los Angeles. Well, well, then how did I find a photo of them at the Beverly Hills Hotel? Right outside the bungalow where Scotty says he set them up for uh, tricks with men and women. And uh, all of these... Uh, all of these things just are uh, findable and uh, help to confirm what Scotty says. And every, you know, there were primary sources, people who were eyewitnesses, other hustlers, other clients who were present for a lot of these things. So Rock Hudson, for instance, was a client, and there are many people that play Scotty with Rock Hudson and say that they met Scotty through Rock Hudson. So if he's telling the truth about all of that, And there is all of this evidence pointing to the Duke and Duchess from diaries and photographs. And why should he be disbelieved? Uh, It it seems to be to be uh, a real stretch in the other direction to say that everything Scotty says is a lie or even some things. Did you feel like this was a really important or significant film to to be making? I think particularly given the current uh, climate and landscape in the world, particularly the Western world, it seems like this kind of story is quite significant right now. Yes, I thought it was significant because I think a coherent alternate history of Hollywood focusing on sex and sexuality, I thought was uh, important to do. I think he's an important character. He's still around and he can tell his own story. He wrote a memoir and, uh, the movie is very different from its book. It's uh, a, a totally different animal than the book, but the book is a worthwhile document as well. So it's great that he told his story both in book and movie form. Uh, since the film was finished more than a year ago, it premiered at the Toronto Film Festival a year ago, and it's been in theaters for uh, a couple months now, almost two months maybe. In the U.S., it'll be distributed around the world. 
later and starting later in the year, uh, that because of the waves of conservatism taking over uh, Western governments and attempts to limit freedoms such as uh, sexual freedoms, homosexuality, attempts to roll back laws that are, uh, you know, protect gay rights, and also abortion laws in the United States are uh, in danger of being uh, rolled back. And Scotty, part of the story, touches on uh, abortion because his daughter died from a botched abortion. It was uh, illegal abortion. So all of the uh, cultural um, markers of Scotty's story, I think, uh, became more relevant in the year after I completed it, because he's a uh, he's a liberationist. He's a, a fighter for freedom and for uh, human rights, and those rights are much more in danger now. So I think uh, he functions as an amazing corollary to. Uh, and reminder of uh, of what uh, it is to be free and what uh, we need to fight for for freedom uh, in in the Western world. Yeah, I think there's like you know as we're sort of talking about each of your documentaries that you've made. I know you've got another documentary on Studio Fifty Four um, that's coming out as well. I wonder, there's there's kind of a, a, not necessarily a political through line, but there's definitely a kind of um, human rights through line in, in each of the films that we've talked about anyway. And I wonder how you look at each of these and what your markers for success would be for your films when you started with Valentino and, and where you're at now with Scotty or Studio 54. Well, I mean, there's so many different levels of success and ways to view success with the film, um, especially a documentary or independent film. Uh, the scale is very different. You know, an uh, independent film that grosses hundreds of thousands of dollars at the box office is considered to be a, a pretty big success. Documentaries this year have been grossing over $10 million at the box office, which is virtually unheard of before. Uh, which is great news for documentaries and uh, very welcome. Why do you think that? Why do you think there is this kind of resurgence, or or not even resurgence, boom in documentary filmmaking? Well, I think that uh, serious filmmaking in movie theaters is very much in danger. Uh, the uh, the film that was considered to be the the kind of bread and butter of uh, of cinema going. Uh, you know, the great role model of it would be something like Casablanca, a film, or Citizen Kane. Movies that are uh, master, considered to be masterpieces of uh, cinematic storytelling don't, almost don't exist anymore uh, in theatrical film because Marvel and blockbusters and superheroes and robots uh, take over. And... Uh, they uh, dominate filmmaking now in uh, worldwide. So the uh, this type of film and documentaries are part of this uh, coherent, intelligent, timeless storytelling in a uh, you know in a in a sophisticated narrative uh, are relegated to HBO and Netflix and. Amazon and streaming right now, uh, and to s and other, you know, venues on cable, which is great. But if you want that as a theatrical experience, it's very hard to come by. So documentaries, I think, have filled the void, and I'm very happy about it. Yeah, and I think it will continue to happen. Yeah. So I guess going back to the uh, before I interrupted you talking about your kind of markers of success for these films. Well, I mean, some of my films have made millions of dollars at the box office, which, again, doesn't sound like a lot, but for a documentary, it's a lot. It's, it's in fact, almost unheard of until recently. 
Uh, some of them have won awards. Uh, some of them have, most of them, and maybe all of them have gotten mostly rave reviews. Uh, and all these things are markers of success uh, in one way or another. Uh, so I think that one thing I discovered in the world of filmmaking that was unknown to me because I had been a journalist writing for Vanity Fair for um, years and not in the film business is that uh, when your film is well received, you know it. There are just many ways to uh, figure that out. <laughs> and, uh, it doesn't just have to be critical reception. It could, people vote in many different ways. So, uh, but when a film is well received, it's it, it gets kind of taken into the system of film festivals and critical appraisal and then audience response. And then now social media response, which is an extension of audience response. And it's a really wonderful experience, uh, especially when it goes well. I have, I've never had one not go well yet, knock on wood. So maybe it's not so great if it doesn't. But uh, <laughs> I, that's, that's how I would answer your question. I, when your film is well received, you really know it. And it's, there's, there's a few things more gratifying. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have... None of my films are 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, but some of them are really damn close, like 94%. So critical response is good. Some critics don't, you know, there are very few critics who have given them bad reviews, but uh, whatever, it's their right to do so. The critics who uh, I respect have given them great reviews. I'm, I'm very happy about that. And uh, I, you know, like like all filmmakers and playwrights, you, you really have to ignore ignore your your uh detracting critics <laughs> you can't go forward <laughs> yeah if you if you carry the bad review around in your glove compartment uh you <laughs> will uh you will be uh quite uh in, impeded in your uh artistic progress i think it'll just create a kind of toxicity and toxic energy that you will uh, right. you'll never be able to aspire beyond uh well i finish all of my conversations with the same question matt then the uh the the question is what makes you silly what makes me silly i oh interesting um well i'm not a big drinker or a uh, user of substances so it would have to be um i think a, a amazing uh piece of satire uh that i can connect with uh in the company of a, of a close, like-minded friend that I think is what makes me silly, <laughs> which is to say to laugh. I mean, there's some things that just strike me funny and then they're a friend, I'll share it with a friend and we just kind of laugh uncontrollably. That for me is, uh, is really what it's all about. Are there any uh, pieces of satire that you've seen recently that have uh, prompted that sort of reaction? Well, actually... Um, Unintentional satire <laughs> uh, is my favorite. I, I love finding books that aren't written as satire, but uh, then I'll read them and give them to a friend who I know will appreciate it and see what I see. And uh, so recently um, I read the memoir of the uh, housekeeper of the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt White House. Uh, Mrs. Nesbitt. It's Mrs. Nesbitt's White House diary. And she was uh, she was an incompetent, total incompetent, but they wouldn't fire her because it was the Great Depression. They felt badly. So for the three terms and one, one year of the Roosevelt administration, 12 years, uh, the White House was run incompetently. And uh, her book is very seriously written. But uh, if you understand what's really going on, it's actually one of the, the greatest uh, parodies or satires uh, <laughs> I've ever read in my life. That's quite brilliant. I'm gonna definitely going to check that out. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>